How powerful is the phrase, I love you. I love you. Hi, this is Neil with Other People's Shoes. I want to call your attention to a new app that I've discovered called World Love Bank. Now, let me tell you something really quick. There's something powerful about the phrase, I love you. It can do wonders to our mental health. It can just make us feel like we matter and that we value that person that we say it to. Now think about this for a second. Think about the person you you. love most in this world. Got them? Now imagine just for a brief moment, imagine if you could never hear the words, I love you you," ever again. That's what World Love Bank is all about. See, what they're doing is they're capturing the I love yous from loved ones that you can go back in and go into that bank like a savings account and withdraw that I love you you. even if that loved one is passed because maybe that loved one has banked their I love you and it'll be there forever so think about that check it out right now World Love Bank on your favorite app store of choice whether that be Apple iOS or Android Google Play check it out now World Love Bank I love you hey Take a walk with me, not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really excited about today's guest. But before we get to her, I do want to just invite you in. That's right. I want to invite you into this conversation that I keep having with people. So if you're wondering how you can do that, two simple, easy ways to do that. You, of course, can jump right over to OPSpodcast.com right now. And you can just leave me a little note of what you heard today. And if you don't like writing, listen, I know, like some of you have the talent for writing. Some of you don't. I'm one of those some of you don'ts. I love to just talk. Obviously, that's why I'm a podcast host, right? You can leave us a voicemail right there on the page. Tell me what you're loving. Tell me, I don't care. Tell me what you're hating. I love that too. Also, if you're over on the social medias, jump on over to your favorite social media of choice and follow us, tweet us at OPS Podcast Show. A little different, kind of the same. Help me welcome in my guest today. I am I, I, I vowed kind of never to do this, but I can't help but bring back one of my favorite people in the podcast community, Planet. And I'm really excited to sit with her because she has a new book coming out. And I don't know about anybody else. Like, I'm not a big reader, but I might make time to read this young lady's book. Such an inspiration to me. She actually said something to me. I'm not going to tell you what she said just yet because I want to get her raw, real reaction to this too. She has said something that has stuck with me for almost two years. Hard to believe. I know. Help me welcome her in all all the way from South Carolina, the doctor is in, Dr. Michelle Bankston. Doctor, how are you today? And I'm so glad to be back with you. Well, first off, that thing that you said to me, which kind of is a little weird because, well, today in real time, the show has surpassed 50,000 downloads. Congrats, my friend. That's pretty exciting, right? Good work. But here's the thing is as I'm celebrating this and I'm sending out the tweets and sending out, you know, the the stuff, that phrase that you said to me, that, as I said, almost two years ago now, really, the only download that matters is the one that has changed someone's life. You probably don't even remember saying that because it was, I mean, maybe you do, I don't know. That has stuck with me for so long. And so every time it happens, I'm like, nope, remember what Dr. Michelle Bankston said, it's the one. It is. And you know, it's funny whether we're writing or we're podcasting or we're seeing patients in the office or we're building a home, we have to remember we're really working for an audience of one and that's first Jesus Christ. And he's the one who who tells us what to do, but he's responsible for the harvest. And man, when I wrapped my head around that, that took so much weight off my shoulders. I just have to be obedient to the next thing he asked me to do and then trust him for the outcome. That's, that's his heavy burden to bear. And I think that's the thing that still, in a lot of respects, still drives me is that one right? Is that next one, right? Whoever that next one might be to your point, whoever he's putting in front of me today. Yes. So Michelle, I know we asked you this once before, but we're going to ask again, maybe it's changed, but we've changed it. Thanks to your good friend, Misty Phillip. I would say she was the catalyst for this. So apparently we're not allowed to ask shoe size anymore. That's what? offensive. I know. I'm ready for that. I know that's offensive. So we're going to change it up a little bit, but that's okay. It's okay. It's been a minute since you've been here. We are going to ask this. Maybe this is a little bit more exciting. Like what style of shoe do you like to wear now? Oh, I like an open-toed shoe with about a one-inch heel. (laughs) 
But I want to go back to your original question, because since I'm the first guest that you've had on your program twice, I think it's only fitting to let your audience know that I have two different shoe sizes, one for the first episode and one for today's episode. All right, share it. I mean, who who knows what Misty knows? Everybody's like, who's Misty? You'll have to go find her. Misty Phillip, I think by his grace is her show. It was because of a childhood illness when I was about three. Doctors don't know whether it was, it was like polio or it was like Rye syndrome or it was, they don't know. They never were able to diagnose. But as a result, I now have a, my left foot is a woman's six and my right foot is a little girl's size 13. So my right foot's about half the size of my left foot. And tomorrow is my birthday. And can I just tell you, I got the greatest birthday present because we actually found two pairs of shoes that we could mismatch and make fit my feet. And I, I've not had a new pair of shoes in years because imagine how hard it is to find shoes two different sizes so drastically apart. So I'm so happy to tell you I've got two different size feet and a brand new pair of shoes to boot. Michelle, getting into this, this is so weird to me. I'm tying my shoe one day as I'm getting ready to go to church or work. I was leaving the house. So I was putting on shoes to leave. And as I'm leaving, I'm doing the loop, swoop and pull. I think that's the right way to tie the shoe. I don't know. There's probably reasons out there to tie it this way or that way. But as I was making that loop to put the bunny through the hole, like my mom taught me, I think kindergarten, maybe first grade. I don't know whenever that was. She can correct me on that. But as I'm doing that, I grabbed the plastic piece and I'm like, huh, thank you, Phineas and Ferb the Disney program, for reminding me that that plastic into the shoelace is called an aglid. And not a lot of people know that. In fact, I've asked a couple of people because I work in a retail environment now, so I'm seeing customers kind of daily. And so just kind of for fun, I'm like, hey, do you know what that plastic into the shoe is? I, I Googled it, but I don't know if Google's right, you know, and, and kind of playing it off like that. And somebody actually said, well, it's actually called an aglid. I was like, interesting. Hmm. The reason why I bring that up is because I think everyone has an aglid. I think everyone has this one thing or maybe multiple things that have kept them from unraveling. Because again, if the aglid isn't at the end of the shoelace, the shoelace truly would unravel. It wouldn't be a shoelace anymore. It would just just kind of yeah. be a mess. So I'm wondering for you, Dr. Michelle, what is your aglet? You know, Neil, I would have to say that my aglet is the fact that no matter what I've gone through in life, and, I, and I've had some major lows and some major highs, but no matter what I've gone through, God has helped me get through it 100% of the time. And because I can look back and go, you know what? You made it through your dad dying when you were 15 years old. You know what? You made it through having to change high schools at 16 when everybody already had their click. You know what? You made it through your husband having cancer three times. Here I sit today with a new cancer diagnosis and I can go, you know what? I got through all those other things 100% of the time. No reason to think we're not gonna get through whatever we face today or tomorrow or next year. It may not look pretty, But that's not the point. The point is we've successfully made it through everything else before so we can do it again. But if I was going to push on that, especially in this day and age right now, there are so many voices. I'm one of them. You're one of them. Doctors. I mean, politicians. I mean, news people, if we can even trust them. The voices of Facebook, the comments in the comment section, whatever, you know. My whole thought is, is that there's so many voices out here right now and about what voice should you be listening to more than most? I find, especially working with patients, but my readers as well, and and it started with me, is that I've spent too much of my life listening to the lies in my head that I didn't pay attention to and I assumed they were truth. But the voice that we need to listen to is the voice of the Holy Spirit. When you have a, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit indwells you. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit Spirit is to remind us of all truth. But the problem is he can't remind us of anything we don't already know. So if I'm not spending time in the word, if I'm not sitting under good biblical teaching, I'm not going to have that truth for him to remind me of. And it's going to be easier to listen to the lies that are swirling around in my head. And we have to battle those lies absolutely every single day. You know, there's a reason that scripture tells us to take every thought captive. And as a neuropsychologist, I can tell you we have between 50 and 70,000 thoughts a day. That's a whole lot of work to take 
every thought captive, but it's when we don't pay attention to what we're thinking and question, where is that coming from? Is that coming from me? Is that coming from the enemy of my soul? Is that coming from the Holy Spirit? And we just let it slide. And when we come into agreement with it, it's like a snowball and it just picks up speed as it keeps going. There was a time I was speaking at a conference, but beforehand I needed a PowerPoint slide and I'm not the most tech savvy. So a friend was helping me and and she said, Michelle, I just, I just need to know what it is that you're trying to convey in these slides. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just so stupid. And within about three seconds, my son who was sitting at the dining room table across from me looked up and he said, only if you believe that mom. And I realized he's right. That was a lie that just swept through my head and had he not brought it to my attention, I'd come into agreement with it. I am not stupid. I have the mind of Christ. Believing I'm stupid will impact what decisions I make, will impact how I relate to other people, will impact whether or not I receive God's love. So truly, there's so much importance that we've got to place on our mindset and what we're thinking and believing. But how do we do that? How do you do that? Because again, listen, you You've already talked about it. Not only you have walked through cancer, but your husband has walked through cancer. We just lost a lady in our church to cancer. Young, young lady. I mean, she's she's probably only a couple of years older than I am. Cancer is devastating. Cancer can be very debilitating, I think. But I ask that because I think for me, when I hear those things, I think, how do you not just shut down? How do you not just you know, throw up the white flag and like, I'm, I'm done. I'm out. I'm not going to do anything. How do you, how do you stop from doing that? Well, I can't say that I've got it all mastered. So I don't want your audience to think that, you know, she, she's just got the perfect way of living. When the doctor called a couple weeks ago and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but your biopsies came back positive for cancer and we need to schedule you for surgery. I went numb. And then I got off the phone and I immediately cried. It was like, a, Lord, really? Again? Like I could be so much more effective if we weren't battling these things. But then I sat there in my sadness for a moment and went, okay, the first thing you've got to remember, Michelle, is this did not take God by surprise. He already knew this was going to happen. It took you by surprise surprise, but you're not running the universe. So don't worry about it. And then I had to go, okay, well, if it didn't take him by surprise and he knows the plans he has for me, which comes from Jeremiah 29, 11, and they are plans for a future and a hope, then I'm going to put my trust that God knows how to get me through this. I don't have to know anything beyond the next moment. Now, does that mean it's not hard? No. Does it mean that I don't go, you know what? I don't want to go through these surgeries. I don't want to have reconstruction. I don't want to lose my energy. No, but what it means is, is that God already planned for that ahead of time. And as long as I'm willing to keep my focus on him and not on fear, you know, I wrote that book, Breaking Anxiety Script how to reclaim the peace God promises. And the crux of that book is where are we putting our trust? And fear is a misappropriation of our trust. When I go into fear, I'm trusting the doctor's diagnosis, the doctor's prognosis more than I'm trusting God's infinite plan for my life. And it's comforting to me to know that my days are already numbered in his book. So he knows, I mean, I could walk out in front of a car today or I could live for the next 50 years. It doesn't matter. He's already ordained it. So I don't have to worry about that. And that gives me great comfort. You know, we've been going through this whole COVID thing and it's hard to lose loved ones, whether it's cancer or or heart problems or COVID. Each of our days are numbered and I'm going to be here as long as God still has purpose on my life. And so when I start to go down that rabbit hole of, I don't want to do this. I'm tired. I'm tired of being in pain. Then I have to redirect my thoughts and go, okay, but I know God never wastes our pain. So Lord, help me to steward this pain well. And that becomes my focus. What has cancer taught you? It's taught me to focus on today because we are not guaranteed tomorrow. It's taught me that I don't have to be in control of everything. And it's taught me to look people in the eye and straight through to their heart and to connect with them. Because you know, Neil, not everybody's going to deal with cancer, but everybody deals with something and everybody needs a smile, needs a pat on the back, needs an encouraging word. And God gives me opportunities, whether it's at the hospital or it's at the grocery store to look somebody in the face and say, I see you today. I love your smile. I hope you have a really good day. And it's amazing when you walk through the checkout line, when you compliment them, they like light up like, wow, everybody's always been so grumpy. And, you know, they want to know how come I couldn't find Dijon mustard? 
And I want to look at them and say, thank you for showing up for work today so that I could get my food. Being someone that works in a retail environment, selling internet to people, that goes a long way. Just want a little food for thought. I am blown away by your strength. Can I just say that? Like, I truly am. And I know it's not easy. Easy to smile. And I know you have kind of this mantra. I'm going to find a reason. So help me with this. What are your reasons right now to smile? I know there's got to be a few. Maybe you want to share some. Oh my goodness. Some parts of the country, perhaps in your part of the country, is still winter. But where I am, there are signs of spring. Just within the last two days, you can see like a quarter of an inch of new leaves budding out on the trees. That makes me smile. We planted over a thousand bulbs. I've got daffodils, and tulips showing up all over my yard. That makes me smile because that reminds me that, you know what? We go through seasons and winter is coming to an end and we're going into a season of spring where new life is coming up. That makes me smile. My boys are coming into town next week. Oh, I love my boys and I miss them so much. But it even makes me smile that they're not living at home anymore because they're doing exactly what God had for them to do. And I love that. But I smile even bigger when they come home. But it's a challenge. And it was about 10 years ago, maybe, that I was very ill on medically induced bed rest for about five months. And the longer I was on bed rest trying to recover, the more I went into the pit of depression. And there were days that I thought, you know what, if this is going to be my life, I'm not sure I want to continue living. I was willing to do whatever it would take for the sake of my boys, because I was not going to let the enemy steal from them like he had stolen from me. And there was one day that I thought, God, I just, I need a reason to get up. I need a reason to look to the day with something other than dread. That verse came to mind that says, the weeping may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. And so I thought, okay, today is going to be a good day because God's joy comes in the morning. And I posted that on Facebook and it resonated with a few people. A couple of weeks later, I was like, darn it. I I don't want to get up. I don't want to face the day. I don't want to keep living this way. And then that verse came to mind, but my grace is sufficient for thee. All right. Today is going to be a good day because God's grace is going to get me through this. And I posted it and more people liked it. That ended up over time, not immediately, but over time becoming a six year daily ministry. Every day on Facebook and every day on Instagram, I go on there and I say, today is going to be a good day because, and I give us a reason to focus on why can today still be a good day despite bankruptcy, despite divorce, despite prodigal children, despite cancer. There is always a reason why today can still be a good day. Now we can have bad moments in a day, but if we're focusing on the bad, the whole day is going to feel bad. But if we're focusing on truth and all of these good day posts come from the truth of God's word, so we can count on that. He is faithful. He is faithful to fulfill his promises. And that has become the new book that you mentioned that's coming out in May. Today is going to be a good day. 90 promises from God to start your day off right. Because sometimes I need a reminder too. I need someone to say, but remember, that's a bad moment. But today's still a good day because God is still on his throne. And that's not a cliche. That's not just a let's gloss over it because life is hard. Life is really hard. I'm in pain 24-7. And if I focus on the pain, it grows. But if I focus on what God wants me to do today, I can shift my perspective and still have a good day. So of those 90 promises, which promise was the hardest to believe in? Probably the promise that God will never leave me or forsake me in the depths of pain. And let's face it, it doesn't have to be physical pain. I know people who are going through emotional pain, financial pain, relationship pain. There are people, so many people going through grief. So let's just generalize pain for a minute. But in the depths of pain, sometimes God can seem really silent and all you want is to hear his voice somehow. Maybe not, you know, this booming, resonating, like cinematic voice, but even that still small whisper in your heart. And it can feel like God's left you. But what I've learned the most through everything I've gone through in my life is that fruit grows in the valleys. Fruit does not grow on the mountaintop. Mountaintops are great and we all want them and we all want that beautiful vista. But it's when we're walking in the valley that we really figure out where our faith and our trust is. And if we will draw closer to God, really that's when the fruit's going to grow. That's why you notice when I still have a smile on my face, despite the pain, it isn't me 
It's that I'm trusting in a good God and I know he's got my best interest at heart, but it is hard. I have to remind myself. I have to tell myself he has not left you just because you don't feel him. You don't see where the wind comes from, but it's there. You see the effect after the wind is blown through. It's the same thing with God. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. But that means I have to be willing to go, okay, your ways are not my ways. I'm going to trust that your way is better than mine. And that's hard. Why was that one so hard? I mean, I mean, again, there's 90 of them. I mean, imagine there's probably a few that were a little hard to put pin to pad. But that one, why for that one for you was the hardest? Because so often it feels like other people don't understand. And I want, everybody wants to be seen and to be understood. That promise was really hard for me because in the depths of pain, I mean, there are nights that I will just bawl like a baby because the pain is so bad and I just want to sleep because if you don't sleep, it makes pain worse. And I cry out and I want God to take the pain right away. But I'm grateful sometimes, Neil, that he doesn't because if we didn't go through pain, we wouldn't need God. When life is easy, It's easy to ignore our need for God. But when I'm going through pain, I've got so much more compassion for other people. And when I'm going through the really hard pain, it reminds me of the pain that Jesus went through when he died that horrific death to save me. And that's something I don't ever want to lose. I don't ever want to lose the appreciation for that because his pain was so much more than mine will ever be. But it served a purpose. You said everybody wants to be seen and understood. Did I get that right? Yeah. Do you feel like right now you're being seen and understood in any way? I do. You know, it's really interesting because I do share about the trials on my social media and in my books. I'm honest and I'm real and I'm vulnerable. But the other day I actually shared a post and I was crying in that post. And it was amazing because people said, you always seem so happy. I've never seen you cry. And I said, I don't ever want you to think my life is perfect because I have ups and downs just like you do. But I want you to know that even when life is hard and tears are leaking out my eyes, I'm still trusting God, but I'm not going to minimalize it and say it doesn't hurt. And I think people really connected with that because people can't connect with perfection. And it's a fine line. I don't want to be whiny and complaining, but I want people to see real life because it's so easy for us to think, well, I'm the only one going through this. Everybody else's social media, you know, it looks like the perfect Disneyland life. And that's just not real life. I want people to see real because we connect with real. No, I I 100% agree. I don't think I've ever cried on Instagram or Facebook though. My friend tried to get me crying at the Duke, North Carolina game a while back because I was (laughs) in tears because we were losing, but I don't think that video has surfaced, thankfully. (laughs) But listen, I have a few friends, acquaintances, friends, even family members that are atheists. They just don't want anything to do with God. I can't help but kind of step into their shoes for a moment here. You and I can easily say, well, well, God will take care. God will provide. God will do this and and have the 90-day devotional, which, by the way, 90 days creates a, a wonderful habit of creating a reason to get up, a reason to smile, a reason to do all that. There are naysayers out there, if you read the comments, I'm sure. Absolutely. That would say, if you love this amazing God, if this God is so strong and so powerful and can do this and do that, why can't he heal Michelle? What would be your answer to that? He absolutely can heal me. But he's not going to be constrained by my definition or my prescription of healing. He could he could snap his fingers, Neil, and make it go away this instant. Or he could spit in my eye or have me put mud on myself or have me go dunk in the water multiple times. Or he can use doctors and surgeons and chemotherapy. Let's face it. Not everybody gets their healing this side of heaven. But what I'm learning as I'm, I'm also, I'm writing a new book and it's knowing God through pain. And what I'm learning as I'm going through that is sometimes the healing that God is doing is greater than the healing I'm asking for. I I want him to heal the physical pain. But what I see him doing even deeper than that is healing some emotional wounds and healing my difficulty accepting his love in whatever form he wants to give it. You know, when I love my children, I do it in the way 
that I can best express it to them, but it may not be the way they want. You know, when they were younger, I know there were times they wanted me to let them go out with certain people. And in my love for them, I said, no, that was not the answer they wanted, but it protected them. And so what I'm learning through this is God absolutely can heal me. He could do it today. He could do it tomorrow. It could be at the end of the month when I have surgery. It might not be this side of heaven, but he's doing a greater work in me. And I'm grateful for that, but I'm still going to pray and I'm still going to believe for the healing, however he wants to do it. Well, again, I I think the flip side of that, and by the way, I think that was an amazing response. The flip side of that, if I'm going to be a spiritual person, we'll just make it a spiritual person, kind of a, a general, not a Christian, not a disciple, not a whatever, not a believer, whatever, but a spiritual person. If I'm worshiping a God or believing in a God that is of my creation, Is it a God? I mean, that's the wacky part I always run into because, again, I I know back in the Old Testament, they were making gods. Yeah. And they were worshiping them. And the God of Baal, I think, comes to mind. And it's like, you made that. It has no power. You made that. It would be like me worshiping the MacBook that I'm on right now or my Rodecaster Pro. You know, these things that have been created. God's not a creation. And so therefore, who am I? He is the creator. Right. Who am I to question the creator? Well, and if we are worshiping God for what he can do for us, are we really worshiping God or are we really worshiping the thing that we want to get from God? 100% agree. He's not a genie. The last time I checked. No, I tried that. <laughs> I tried that. The thing is, if it's true worship, we're going to continue to worship and praise even when our prayers aren't answered the way we want them to be. But I know he is capable. You mentioned earlier in the program about my husband. When he was diagnosed with cancer, we sat across from that oncologist. We had a one-year-old little boy and the oncologist said, Mr. Branson, I'm so sorry. You need to go home and get your affairs in order. You've got less than two years to live. Neil, that was 21 years ago. God healed my husband, but it wasn't just a snap of the finger. He had to go through a 23-hour surgery, a year of chemotherapy, follow-up since then. And there are other people that I know are contending for their healing and their healing of their bank accounts, the healing of their marriage, the healing of estranged relationships with their children. But the true measure of our faith is will we continue to believe while we're in the waiting period? Are we going to steward that time well? I don't want to focus every day on, has God healed me yet? How come God hasn't healed me yet? I want to focus today on today is a good day because God gave me breath today. So what am I going to do to make the best use of today to honor him and the gifts and talents he's given me? That's funny that you would say while I'm waiting. So there was a song that came out. I think Kurt Cameron was in it of all people, but oh, he's, yes. he's in this movie Fireproof and there's this song that comes on. It's by John Waller, if I'm saying his name right. Yes. But he says, while I'm waiting, and that is a terrible song first off, because I hate waiting. But there's a lyric in there I was trying to find, and it said, will I worship while I'm waiting? Exactly. Will I serve while I'm waiting? Will I not faint while I'm waiting? Yeah. I am just blown away by your strength. Again, I know it's not easy every day. I know there are days that you're probably just like, nope, I can't. Not today. But if I could ask this, and I'm, I'm trying to tread delicately, I know we're, we're pretty good friends. If God's timing next month, you're you're done. You're no longer Michelle. You're, you're in heaven, which is amazing. We'll celebrate. What do you hope people remember most about you? I want people to remember me as someone who knew that hope prevails. And that is not a cliche. It is where are we going to put our faith? And even in the difficult times, I want people to remember that but she continued to trust God. Even if he didn't heal her this side of heaven, she continued to trust. Why do you think that's so important for folks to remember and and even for you to remember? Because we live in this digital age where we're used to everything happening at lightning speed. And we've gotten so used to things happening so fast is like that vending machine society. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but I'm getting to the age where I no longer want to wait an hour to eat at a restaurant. Like I don't want to wait that long. And I used to wait two hours outside the cheesecake factory 30 some years ago when we first got married for a good meal. I, I don't want to wait. So we're in a society where people give up so fast when things don't happen in a split second. They don't want to keep putting in the effort. And I want to be one that people will say of me, but she kept trying because that 
that's where the results come from. You know, we just had the Olympics recently. Those athletes had to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying to get where they are. And for those who weren't on the podium, what are they going to do now? Are they going to keep trying or are they going to give up? Because I think that tells more about a person than just standing up there having won the prize. What are they going to do in the meantime? Yeah, Usain Bolt, speaking of the Olympics, he's quoted as saying he trained four years for a 20-second race. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Four years for 20 seconds. With no guarantees. By the way, he's still one of the fastest people on the planet. Just want to put that out there. Michelle, as we start to wrap up, I'm curious about this. I, I know it's been a minute since we've had you on, but new book coming out. Where can people go to find that? Where can we reconnect with you? How can we go about doing that? All my books are on Amazon, christianbook.com, Barnes and Noble. But if you want to find me, tons of free resources and our new Hope Vault, was, which is just a huge vault of free resources for people, go find me at drmichelleb.com. And I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, all the socials. I have not made it to Pinterest yet. I, I still feel like that's a little out of my realm as a dude. <laughs> I don't know. But I've heard other guys are on Pinterest. I, I don't know. What is, I, never mind. What is, I don't even, I got to research Pinterest. We'll put research on that. I don't even know what Pinterest is still to this day. It's recipes, right? No? Pinterest is going to take every remaining minute out of your day. So while you still have kids at home, you stay focused on podcasting. <laughs> I'll put my daughter on it. She's 14 going on 25, you know, so that's how that goes. Awesome. So glad to have you on today. Cannot wait till the new books arrive. But before we do that, we got to make sure we play this game together. And it's an amazing game called Senseless. We have reworked it since you've been on last. So really excited about that. So here's our game Senseless, just to remind the, the listeners at home if they have forgotten. We do this game, Silliness is it's called senseless. We we take our senses, we put them on a die, and we come up with six random questions for you. So you ready for this? This is our game. I have my fancy North Carolina cup, which by the way, I had to go to the doctor because it broke. It fell off a shelf, and so it has actually been split in two, kind of like my heart sometimes. <laughs> my beloved Tar Heels. Broken in half sometimes. So here we go. I'm gonna roll for you. And you got ooh, I was hoping you were gonna get this. That is a six, believe it or not. It is a blue six even. One person you would love to spend the weekend with, and what would you do? I would love to spend the weekend with my father who died when I was young. I would have all the family over so that he could see the legacy that he left. My boys never got to meet my dad. My husband never got to meet my dad. There are so many questions about my family history and, and what his hopes and dreams were for me and my brother. That would be amazing. And I might not get to have that conversation this side of heaven, but when I get to heaven, we're gonna have a long talk. There's just so much richness in our heritage that I don't think we always know how important it is to take advantage of listening to that information while people are with us. So that's definitely who I would spend the weekend. Where would you guys go? Would you would you stay in the South Carolina area or would you go somewhere else? Oh, heck no. I'd take them to a good, a good beach. We'd have good seafood on the beach. We'd have long walks, watch the sunset, someplace totally leisurely, and I'm not going to do the cooking. But Michelle, I'm really serious. Like when I started planning this new season, you immediately started jumping in my mind. I'm like, wait a second. We, we can have like a second guest, but I'm like, if we're going to ever have one, we're going to have Michelle because she is just such a delight and a joy. But I'm serious. Like if we can get real, real serious for a minute, I know there are praying people out there. I know there are praying people that listen. If you wouldn't mind sharing, how can we pray for you effectively as my listeners? If they hear this and somebody is a diehard prayer warrior, what's a prayer request you would give them? I would honestly say the biggest one is pain relief and focus because I don't want my focus to be on the pain. I really want it to be on the reason I'm here to give encouragement and inspire people to keep walking forward despite how hard the road is. But the pain does interfere. And so prayer for pain relief would be so appreciated. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. All right, guys and gals, kids and campers alike. It is always the sad part of the show where we say goodbye, but it's only for now. It is only for now. Don't worry. We will be right back here next week. So so join us then. But before we go, I just want to ask you this question. Food for thought, maybe. What's that thing 
that that painful thing in your life right now. Now, I know this is going to sound maybe a little weird to some. I don't work with wood a ton, but a number of years ago, and it's probably been more than a number now, it's probably been about 10 years ago, our church was doing a remodel. And I got a sliver stuck in my hand, and it just never went away, and it continued to fester, it continued to fester. I thought I was going to actually have to go to the doctor because it was so bad, and the pain was starting to get very unbearable. And I remember being such a baby about it. I remember just that took my focus. But I believe today, if you heard and you really tuned in and you really listened, that despite the pain of life, there is another answer. I hope you heard that other answer today. In fact, I'm curious about this for you. What pain in your life is so powerful that God cannot help you with? Can you let me know that? I would love to know that. As a host, as a friend, as a whoever I am to you, let me know. You can do that at OPSpodcast.com. You can reach out to us on social media at OPS Podcast Show. Or you can even reach out to our guest today, Michelle. She would love to hear that too. But guys, just remember this. Just remember this. Do not be defined by your pain. Do not be defined by your pain. Not at all in any way. And also remember this. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned until next week when we walk in other people's shoes.